Right, it's two o'clock, guys. I'm ready to start. I'm just waiting for the video link. Right, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's um, strategic planning meeting. I'm Councillor Rogers, and I'm chairing today's meeting. To my right, the planning officers, Stephen Hunt, James Chatfield, and Anna Weldale, and Keith Thompson, and highways officers, Andy Fursey. To my left are Jane Dale, Democratic Services, and the council solicitor, David Crampton. Also in the chamber, members of the committee and obviously members of the public. Arrangements for dealing with the planning applications, an officer's summary and update will be given. Items involving members of the public will be dealt with first, and speakers are restricted to five minutes with a warning when 30 seconds remain. Speakers are not permitted to circulate additional information, including photographs, plans or petitions. Any councillor not on the committee who was requested to speak will also be given the five minutes. Members are also to note the information given by, by, given by officers and speakers. Uh, any decisions proposed which are contrary to the recommendations contained in the report will require reasons if proposal is to refuse and reasons and conditions if the proposal is to uh, approve the application. In accordance with the Council's equality policy, speakers are asked to refrain from making comments which can be construed, uh, constructed as being dis uh, discriminatory or deflammatory, otherwise it will be necessary to intervene. Additionally, I would request that although differing views may be expressed, that we all respect those differing views. Please ensure mobile phones are switched off to avoid any disruption during the meeting, and whilst you're not speaking, will you please put yourselves back onto mute? Um, there's no fire alarm planned for today, but if one goes off, then, you know, please be directed where to go. So. First item on the agenda, any declarations of uh, pecuniary and non-pecuniary interest? Uh, Councillor Whittle. Thank you, Chairman. On the first item on the agenda, I received information uh, correspondence, to which I have not responded. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Kaysen. Same. Thank you. Thank you. Same. Are we all going to go the same? Yeah. Is everybody in agreement? See if we put you all down. I think we've all had varying emails of everybody. You're all happy with that? Yes. Have we got some? Can we get some more volume on? Yeah, we'll do that for you. Councillor Meredith. I figured I can keep going at the moment while I don't need extra volume. Um, just to say that I have uh, received correspondence from both applicants and objectors, and I have responded, therefore the difference, with Councillor Whittle's declaration, just to thank them for taking the time to contact me and pointing out I can't comment or provide opinion. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Councillor McMaster. Likewise with uh, Councillor Meredith, I have yep. received correspondence and I had responded um, just to say that I couldn't comment. That's fine. Yeah, no, obviously I've had, had them all. I don't, I don't respond. Just been chair, I tend not to. So we, we noted that we have all received them though. Thank you. Um, right, item two, to approve the uh, correct minutes of committees held on the 29th of February. Uh, can we have a proposal for those minutes, please? Um, uh, Council McMaster, second there. Uh, Councillor Kaysen, all in favour? So everybody, Councillor Healy, are you in favour of those minutes? Yeah, yeah, it's brilliant. What's that? So we're on to um, agenda item. Sorry, any withdrawals? There are no withdrawals, Chair. I always managed to miss one item on the agenda. Number four, we're on to land south of uh, Catfoss Big Farm. This is the asphalt plant. Are we any updates? Yes, thank you, Chair. I do have an update. Since the publication of the committee report, five further comments have been received from local residents and businesses. One letter from Robson's Builders Merchant expressed support. Letters of objection have been received from Musgrave Transport, Premier Modular and two local residents. It's noted that the letter from Premier Modular was also sent to members directly. The points are summarised below. Concern raised about the position of the asphalt plant and its closeness to the school. The negative impact the proposal will have on local businesses and the local economy. The applicant has failed to satisfy the previous reason for refusal, as objectors consider that the use is still inappropriate in this area, which is predominantly surrounded by B8 uses. Concern about pollution and emissions from the plant and its effect on residents, animals and workers at local businesses, including Musgrave Travel, Premier Modular and BCK. Concern in particular is raised about the use of bitumen, whether it's safe and how emissions, including bitumen fuel, 
volatile organic compounds, PM10, hydrogen sulfide, sulfur di and sulfur dioxide will be controlled and monitored. Concern raised that LPG fuel, which is liquid petroleum gas, was proposed to be used during the pre-committee presentation, but this was not mentioned on the application form and how this will be safely controlled and monitored. Following these objections, further clarification has been sought from both public protection and the applicant on the points raised. Public protection have confirmed that the applica applicant has provided a robust air quality assessment to accompany the application and concurs with the findings of that assessment in that there will be no breach of any human health objectives as a result of the development. Public protection therefore have no reason at all to object to the application. Public protection have recommended conditions to the consultation to control emissions during the construction phase of the development, requiring that the developer comply with the mitigation measures set out in the air quality assessment. The reduction in stack height has been factored into the air quality assessment. As with all work activities, the applicant will be subject to the Health and Safety at Work Act and be regulated by the Health and Safety Executive. The HSE has commented on the application and raised no concerns. The local air pollution prevention and control regime sets standard operating conditions, monitoring requirements and limits for emissions to air for various industrial activities and installations. The ins this installation will require a permit to operate. The permit will be issued by the council and the installation, if approved, will be required to comply with a number of conditions to control the ongoing management and operations on site with a view to controlling emissions, both fugitive and from the stack. The council have the knowledge and experience in regulating plants of this type. It's important to note that the council will only issue a permit to the installation if, they are, if public protection are satisfied that the operation can be compliant for this type of installation, and it will be for the applicant to demonstrate that this as part of their application for a permit. The application, sorry, the applicant has provided safety data, a safety data note which confirms the product when properly handled is not dangerous for human health. Harmful effects are expected only in case of misuse. The applicant is not con currently proposing liquid petroleum gas storage on site. And has, confirmed that, and has confirmed that reference to this in the pre-committee presentation was made on a hypothetical basis. Consent is not sought for the storage of this and the air quality assessment has been done on the basis that the applicant would use light fuel oil as a worst case scenario. This was found to be acceptable on air quality terms. Future consent may be required for the storage of LPG. Hazardous substance, substance consent would be required for the storage of LPG over 25 tonnes. This would be controlled and monitored by the HSE. The HSE have not raised any concerns with the proposal. In terms of any vessel to store the LPG, the business would, if approved, have some PD rights to build minor extensions or would need to apply for planning permission for anything larger. Members would have the option to remove PD rights by a condition under part seven and the relevant sections would be A, H and I of the GDPO, which allows for small scale extensions to industrial buildings to maintain a level of control over this form of development in the future. The applicant has also provided a briefing note and answers to the pre-committee questions, which was also sent to members directly. This along with officers own research has been in, used to inform the answers to the pre-committee questions below. So the questions, um, Councillor Healy asked, why a 15 metre stack was the applicant's second choice and are there any environmental implications of this? The applicant has confirmed that a 15 metre stack was the next choice purely based on landscape and visual reason for re refusal from the previous application. This was deemed suitable in the wider context of the industrial estate for the reasons stipulated in the land use character assessment that is on the planning file. Public protection have confirmed that the reduction, reduction in stack height was factored into the air quality assessment. The applicant has provided a robust air quality assessment to accompany the application and public protection concur with the findings of that assessment in that there will be no breach of any human health objectives as a result of the development. The conclusions of the air quality assessment clearly state that there were no changes to the conclusions based on the reduction of the height of the scheme. 
Furthermore, the actual velocity of the airflow from the stack is the main stipulation in planning terms. Reducing the stack height had no effect on the velocity, which has been reinforced by the air quality assessment. The applicant has also noted in their briefing note that their plant at Dewsbury has a vent stack of 8.5 metres and that has been awarded a permit, which is shorter than the proposal. Their site at Dewsbury has no non-conformities since being in operation and no problems identified by the Kirklees Environmental Health Officer. Councillor White asked if any other companies on the estate have an environmental permit. Public Protection have confirmed that Thurston Group, based on Capfoss Industrial Estate, hurled an environmental permit for, for curting process. Also, Alker Kerber Limited on Catic Lane requires a permit, but this is, this is also located some distance away, around one kilometre. The applicant has submitted information to state that Premier Modular also held, held a permit for discharge of water to ground sorry, of discharge to groundwater, which is a permit required by the Environment Agency to um, prevent polluting of liquids into the ground. This is controlled by the Environment Agency and not the Council's public protection team. The only permit, permit required by the applicant is for the curting of road stone, which is a pre prescribed activity under the Environmental Permitting Regulations 2016 and is listed within Section 3.5 Part EB of Schedule 1. The process will require a Part B permit, which public protection have confirmed is at the low end of pollution risk with the hierarchy of per permitting regime. Also, the asphalt plant is at the lower end of the LAPPC risk rating scheme. Paragraph 194 of the MPPF clearly states that planning decisions should be based on whether proposed development is acceptable is an acceptable use of land rather than the control of processes or emissions where these are subject to separate pollution controlled re regimes. Planning decisions should assume that these regimes will operate effectively. Councillor Norman asked to clarify with public protection why they have no comments in relation contam to contamination. Comments in relation to contamination relate to the current contamination situation on the site and whether decontamination will be required before the proposed land use can operate. Usually this, in, this is in the case of a change of use to a more sensitive use like residential. Public protection do not comment on the future ground contamination issues in relation to any proposed use. Any impact on groundwater in terms of pollutants is regarded by the EA sorry, is regulated by the EA and they have raised no objections to the proposal subject to conditions requiring the development is carried out in accordance with the foul drainage report. To confirm, the site is not located in a source protection zone where the aquifer is particularly sensitive. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, for that. So we've got um, three speakers today on this application and we're going to start with uh, Mrs. Uh, J. Southernwood, if you'd like to come up, you're here on, uh, I forgot what day it was now, uh, Monday, I think. Um, so you know the uh, the rules. So if you press play on your microphone when you're ready and uh, you may begin. Good afternoon. Um, you've had a great deal of highly technical detail by now, and I don't, uh, I won't revisit those specific um uh, specifics apart from a few key points along with a summary of our main objections. Now the previous application was unanimously refused and this one is barely changed but significantly reduces the stack height to 15 meters. The previous 20 meter was at the time stated essential to safely disperse the processes emissions. Yet we had no explanation of how the five metre lowering impacted that. And we then illustrated with the government's official guidance just how much emission density and longevity is impacted. And the makeup of these plus fugitive emissions in vapour or dust is a noxious mix and includes particulate matter 2.5, which is some 30 times finer than a human hair and causing serious lung problems. The heating of bitumen is described in the asphalt industry safety data as extremely flammable, fatal if inhaled and causing organ damage. We welcomed clarification of the LPG fuel to power the plant, but this introduces yet another health and safety concern not previously addressed, the potential for explosion. 
We noted how animal receptors were emitted from the assessments. And this is important because of animals' heightened sensitivity and the consequential economic impact on the operation of the neighboring kennels and cattery. Yet the weight ascribed to human receptors and locations based miles away and in whole city center even is by contrast of little relevance to this site and the immediate surroundings. Newley have continued to ignore the existence of one other plant in the East Riding, that of Hull Asphalt's Melton plant, which is only 12 miles away from where we're sitting today. And they also claim their ability to amply supply our region from that local base. Acknowledging that planning conditions are commonly applied, however, they are often of a more administrative or generic nature than these from our flood authority and drainage teams consultees. And their more stringent demands do imply to me that a fear for flood potential on site and further down to the Leven floodplain is clearly in their minds. To summarize our other key objections, the highways and traffic issues raised by almost all, the A165, 1035 and local village roads cannot cope now in terms of congestion and maintenance, and large increases in HGV volumes bring further air pollution risks as well. The concerns of our tourism and hospitality venues from visitors already voicing their disquiet, and a reminder of just how vital the tourist economy is to the Brandsburton area. The anger, distress and harm to well-being of village residents and those almost, almost directly alongside the plant, like Brandsburton Grange. Can you imagine the lighting nuisance on dark early mornings, noise, vibration and dust six days a week, only around 100 metres from your home? The farmer's fear of land and food chain con contamination and the negative economic impact expressed so clearly by BCK, Mana Caravans and Premier Modular, over 320 jobs between them and 12 profit by Newlay. And whilst the National Planning Framework states the preference for basing such a development on an existing industrial site, that cannot apply to Catfoss where it be incompatible in every aspect, not just size and scale, but its use harmful to the existing wholly light industrial, non-polluting users and the environment. The framework has three overarching objectives, economic, social and environmental, and this application cannot be said to comply with a single one. And whilst it may be desirable to attract inward investment into the county and to make full use of the CATFOS site, this proposal is simply not the answer. I return to that unanimous decision to refuse an you almost have, identical application left. last year. Ask how anything you've heard could cause you to change your minds now, appraised of these issues. I urge members today to repeat that refusal and strengthen the reasons for it still further based on the arguments of policy non-compliance. We trust you to make the right decision for us today. And in doing so, we hope to prevent yet another application for this plant in Bransburton appearing before you yet again. Thank you for listening. Mr. Southern, well, thank you very much. If you'd like to take your seat. Uh, the applicant, Mr. M. Good is next. Mr. Good, you were also with us at the pre-presentation. See so you now how things work. Again, begin so when you're ready. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd just like to start by saying we've reviewed the officer's report and consider it a balanced and objective assessment of the planning merits of this case. Our client would like to thank the, the um, committee for the opportunity to present on, on Monday just gone. Uh, I don't wish to repeat most of the issues we raised at that, at that session other than to summarise that Newley are an established company who have successfully operated out of their Dewsbury plant for over 10 years. They had non, have had no non-conformities over that period. It's also worth stating the Dewsbury plant is actually a lot closer to residential properties. It's within a residential area. And the Kirklees Environmental Health Officer hasn't raised any issue at any time over that 10-year period. Further to that, it's worth stating that there are a number of asphalt plants across the country, and we aren't aware of any that have created any significant issues anywhere uh, else. Proposals at CATFOS uh, represent a significant investment for the company and will actually provide a higher specification plant than is currently operated in their Dewsbury site. The estate itself is an established industrial estate. In land use planning terms, the site largely falls under use class B2, which is general industrial as does the application site and the proposals. 
It's important for members to note that the B2 users could occupy that site uh, without the need for further planning permission. These uses may also be subject to separate permitting regimes. As members are aware, um, and as we've previously mentioned, the operation will not require any chemical process to be undertaken on the site. It simply involves coating heated stone with bitumen. This is the third application by our client, and they have continually sought to address the previous reasons for refusal by re removing, uh, sorry, by moving location of the plant to a more central location within the industrial state, amending the design and providing landscaping. It's considered that these amendments overcome the council's previous reasons for refusal, which related to landscape character. The changes to the scheme have not raised any objection from the experts in their fields, the statutory consultees, and this is common to the previous two applications. Your officer has, has already gone through the pre-committee meeting questions. I won't go through those in detail other than to reiterate that in terms of the stack height, the air quality assessment did take account of that reduced stack height and raised no issue with, and your, your own environmental health officer raised no issue with the outcomes of that. It's worth noting that the Dewsbury uh, plant has an 8.5 meter stack height as per the award permit, and once again, Kirkley's environmental health have raised no issues and no non-conformities. You mentioned already the business permits at Catfoss. I won't go through those in detail, but it's worthwhile noting that there are other businesses that have permitting regimes. But it's also worth noting that the MPPF is very clear on this point that you should not seek to conflate planning and control of process emissions. Similarly with land contamination, your officer identified the reasons why, why, that was, uh, why that issue was not covered, and I don't intend to go through that further. Just to finally conclude, the local plan policies of the extant local plan policy S4 and EC1 are both clear that industrial development should be supported on industrial estates such as CATFOS. Indeed, policy A1 clearly identifies that development decisions should support the role that CATFOS industrial estate has in contributing to the economy. Just to finally conclude members, I would implore you to take the advice of your own officers and those of the statutory consultees and respectfully request that this application is approved. Thank you. Mr. Good, thank you for your time. If you'd like to take your seat. Our third speaker and final speaker on this application is Councillor Owen. Councillor Owen, obviously you know the rules. Um, again, take your seat and begin when you're ready. Thank you very much, Chairman and, and committee members. And I'm addressing you this afternoon as a local ward member representing not only Bransburg but other surrounding pa uh, parishes in support of their objection to this application. I attended the pre-committee presentations on Monday of this week. I must thank both the objectors and the applicant in their structured approach to describe their respective positions. As a long-standing councillor, I have probably had too much experience both on planning committees and on a range of application over the years. So I'm fully conversant with our officers' responsibilities and accept most of their reasoning for coming to their conclusions on the factual evidence supplied uh, in this application. However, I was elected by my local residents to support their reservations and strength of feeling and ensure that their views are heard and considered. The village of Bransburton has over the years suffered from issues of odour, smell nuisance, that have required intervention from both this council with the Environment Agency and others. From landfill sites where pressure from this council and others had been required over the years. Residents are fully aware of how far particulates, odours, etc. can actually spread in this location. It has a large surrounding area that has become a home for a range of tourist businesses and almost become a rural haven within easy reach of the coast. And I fully understand the fears of future incidents with the introduction of a potential asphalt plant in close proximity, where future emissions may not so readily be noticed and be more invisible. My assessment of the pro proposed site and that of many residents is that it is light industrial use. And this plant really would be a departure towards a more serious form of industrialization despite whether it falls under the current agreed designations for such a site. We must also not forget other small businesses that fear they will be affected that do not operate on the industrial site but are based close by. 
As mentioned by the objectors, the large number of conditions placed on the application are possibly a reflection of the nervousness of officers rather than a clear acceptance of the site's suitability. The objectors have also used relevant planning policies to explain their concerns where they feel challenge is necessary. And I don't need to go over those again. Of course, we can all be accused of nimbyism, but I have general concerns that impact on planning as follows. Whilst appreciating the usefulness of an asphalt plant in the East Riding, this is the wrong location for a business of this type. I think it was probably an opportunistic site, but it is better suited to a site where heavier industrial usage is experienced. Transport issues are a concern in neighbouring villages with the transport that will have to pass through them and the volume of traffic. And my other fear is the ability and capacity, both of us as an authority and the other statutory agencies to actually monitor conditions on an ongoing basis moving forward over the years. There is also a risk to existing businesses relocating as a result, as per the letter from Mr. Fothergill from Premier Modular Limited that you were all sent. I appreciate fully that members have to consider material planning concerns, but may I also ask that they consider the responsibility to our communities. One of the key failures in my mind over the years of our national planning policies and guidance is that whilst applicants have the right of appeal, and rightly so, the public do not, and it is down to us, their elected representatives, to champion their causes and concerns. This application is little different from the application you have already refused in the past, and the impact on the rural environment and surrounding villages is the same. I hope you may reach the same conclusions as you did before, for reasons of community support and common sense. Thank you, Chairman and Committee. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Members, if there's no further updates from officers, we'll open it up to the floor. Who would like to kick us off? Councillor Meredith. Thank you, Chair. I have a couple of questions, actually, if I may. Uh, the first one is just in relation to one of the comments made uh, in the objections. It's on page 16. Um, it's near the very bottom, and it talks about um, the limit on the height of other premises in the area. And there's uh, mention has been made of a 10-metre or lower constraint on other surrounding premises, properties, businesses, structures, etc. I was just wondering if that was actually enforced in planning condition, and if so, if this is a deviation from what could be considered a standard template in the area. And just uh, FYI, Chairman, that is my first of two questions. Thank you, Councillor Meredith. I'm not aware of any planning conditions on any surrounding developments that limit the height, um, other than the height of storage, open storage, um, um, without seeing these specific applications in front of me now, but it's quite a common condition to limit the site, the height of um, open storage. And there are some open storage sites around here to prevent stacking of storage containers. Um, sorry, through you, Chair. Sorry. sorry. Uh, that's fine. Uh, Councillor Meredith, are you coming in with a second question? If I may, please. Yes, you can. And, yeah. and just to say, on Monday, it was specifically mentioned that that uh, height restriction was applied to storage. In the report, it's a bit more generic, and so I thought it best to seek some clarity. Mm -hmm. uh, the other point, and it's actually mentioned a couple of times on pages 16 and on 17, about a either three or three to three and a half kilometre exclusion zone um, nearing a settlement with regard to asphalt production. And I was just wondering, is that guidance? Is that regulation? One of them says it's a rule, one of the comments. Another one specifically says that the industry of asphalt production itself advises a standoff distance of three to 3.5 kilometres from neighbouring residences. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, that isn't a planning uh, rule or planning consideration that we know of, obviously, we know that the Dewsbury one is close to residential properties um, it, and obviously any concerns to do with that would could be dealt with via a permit which is separate to planning consideration. If I may just finish that, because uh, my worry was is that uh, we all know here that the planning goalposts are on roller skates and the roller skates often have fireworks attached and what once was a rule may not be, what once wasn't a rule may now be and again I just thought it prudent to see clarity. Thank you. Thank you Councillor Meredith. Councillor Whittle. Uh, thank, thank you Chairman. Well, 
this is a third time of of of, of asking. Uh, I do feel, Chairman, that this is really like a, a process of attrition. You know, having been refused the first time, they tried for the second time, and now they're back again. Have we considered, Chairman, how much distress this causes to our residents in the area and the surrounding area? Have we considered genuinely how, how the inhabitants of Bewholm, North Frodingham, Bransburton uh, feel about this continual insistence that heavy industry is appropriate for this particular plot of land? We all as a committee went to have a look um, prior to the last application and one member at that particular site visit said, shush, what can you hear? Um, we sort of looked at him and said, nothing. He says, exactly. All you can hear is the odd bird song. Apart from that, silence. Then a desultory truck arrived, not making too much noise. But it gave a feeling of a peaceful, uh, light industrial site, largely used for storage, of caravans and the like, and not by any means somewhere where you'd expect to find a, a, an industrial uh, activity of this nature. Furthermore, Chairman, uh, I, I managed to arouse a, a wry smile at the last committee meeting uh, when I referred to dogs and cats being kept in stables. Um, they, they don't actually live in stables, they live in kennels and we have B BK nearby. Now, I don't know how many members are aware of um, olfactory receptors in animals, but just for your interest, dogs have 300 million olfactory receptors in their noses. Humans have five to six million. Bit of a difference there. But importantly, on section 634, it says the impact of development upon the health of cats and dogs as cited as objections doesn't matter. It would only represent a material planning consideration in respect of the impact of the development upon the existing adjacent business. Well, I'm asking you, Chairman, if you had a dog, maybe you have a dog, I don't know, uh, if you had a dog and you wanted to put it in kennels, would you put it somewhere where it's going to be in distress from having uh, these of obnoxious odours, which we may not even be able to smell ourselves, being impacted upon them. And that made me think further, Chairman, upon the comments made by Premier Modular and others about the impact of the development upon their businesses. Would they want to have their, their operators live, working on site within uh, reach of anything which comes out from this site? I certainly wouldn't. We have a, a duty of care to our operators. We have a duty of care to our fellow human beings and to force them to work next door to this site would be inappropriate. And we have this contention about the stack. I, I, I'm, I'm confused about this, Chairman, because you know, if it's okay at the height it is now, why did it uh, put the application in in the first place for it being that much higher? I, I, I don't really follow the logic of that. And then we come, of course, Chairman, to the uh, the old question of functional need. Is there a functional need for this site to be where it is, this this particular installation to be where it is? We have whole asphalt over at Melton. We have Friday thought. I mean, they, they insisted that there is a functional need to have it slap bag in the middle of the countryside in a tourism site uh, where people come to relax, to enjoy their time away from... Uh, their business, their work, and can you imagine going to your static or your holiday home and hearing the clatter of trucks going past every every three or four times an hour? And that's only if you divide it. I mean, it says in the report that three or four trucks an hour didn't matter. But, of course, they won't be going three or four every hour. They'll be going during the operational period. And similarly, if you're on holiday... Do you really want to uh, consider being woken up about five or six in the morning, which is when this installation would, would operate? Uh, um, I'm, I'm always coming back, Chairman, to my, my basic objection to this, and I think it's an objection which is valid 
and it is represented by all the people who have objected to this site. It is in the wrong place. There, are, there must be other sites in the East Riding which are far better set up for this sort of operation. There must be other sites, Chairman, in the East Riding which are not surrounded by tourism, which don't have schools nearby, which don't have many, many residents nearby, which, don't, which have better road and rail links. There must be other sites, Chairman. I think that, in the words of Councillor Owen, common sense should really prevail on this. And we must avoid this, this continual attrition, which I feel is trying to wear us down. So we'll say, oh, all right, yeah, you've tried three times, yeah, three times, three times is enough, off you go. No, Chairman. I don't think we should uh, accept this, um, this application. Uh, I feel that the original uh, reasons for refusal have not been overcome in as much as it is the wrong development on the wrong site. And also, uh, I would be inclined to add that the negative impact upon uh, existing businesses on the site, which is a material consideration, should be considered. I'm not proposing anything at the moment, Chair. I think somebody else should have a go. But um, that is my, the nature of my argument. And if nobody else will propose refusal, I shall come back and do so. Thank you, Thank Chair. you, Councillor Whittle. Councillor Healy. Thank you, Chairman. So this is a, a, re, a, a resubmission of a planning application that was refused by this committee. And I understand that that application has also gone to appeal. I think it's um, very important, therefore, that we, we look at the original reason for refusal, because for me, there may well be a um, case for introducing other planning concerns, uh, material concerns. But I think it's important that we focus on, on what that original reason for refusal was, and then to look at the, um, the, the, the five changes, effectively, that's been proposed and which are listed at point six point three. So uh, I just indulge you while I go through this. Um, so it was refused because the site is located in the countryside and the existing site and surrounding uses are low level and light industrial. So low, low level light industrial important to have underlined those. This proposal would introduce a heavy industrial use of a scale that is not considered to be appropriate for its countryside location. And by virtue of its size, scale and use, it would be out of character with the surrounding area and would have an adverse visual impact on the rural character and would therefore be harmful to the intrinsic character of the sites, the rural surroundings and the visual amenity. So it's focusing on, a, on the street, well, I think it's two things really. Visual amenity was clearly uh, an area, a very important area that they're focusing on, uh, as well as uh, use. So it's a size, scale, and use. So I wasn't on the committee that made this decision, but size, scale, and use were clearly the issue for this committee uh, and visual amenity. Um, so in fairness to the to the applicant, they've. they've it wasn't refused on any other grounds other than um, size, scale and use and its impact on the visual amenity. So then looking at the five reasons, because the question is, has these five reasons um, made a change significant enough for this decision to be to be changed? And this, I think, is the is the nub of what we have to consider now. Um, the first and the most significant is this reduction in the height of the stack. Now, um, I did ask the question at the at the briefing about, well, why um, did you not come with a 15 meter stack initially? Um, if you could have, you know, got away with a smaller stack, and the uh, Mrs. S Southernwood did actually say as well that when that question was asked it, initially the applicant was saying that this, the, the largest stack was essential to disperse the emissions. So they said it was essential, and yet it's no longer essential because it's been reduced. So that's a point that's, that's worth um, making. 
And in addition to that, the whole thing's been reduced in scale. Uh, I think the other four points would say additional reductions in the height and density of the machinery, reconfiguration, uh, removal of a small section of building, and then some landscaping. So in other words, they've made it smaller. And their argument, I suppose, is that because they've made it smaller and reduced the height of the stack, therefore that deals with the visual amenity issue. That's kind of what they're suggesting. Um, and it may well be that they that they have to a degree because the because the thing is 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 smaller and will probably have less of an impact. However, um, it wasn't just size and scale uh, that it was re rejected on. It was also use. It's only a very small word, use, but it is in there by virtue of its size, scale, and use. It would be out of character, um, and and that this is an inappropriate use. Uh, of a of a site which up until this point has fairly light industrial usages. Um, so I think we have to ask ourselves therefore, whilst they might have made it smaller, this is still uh, the same use. So the so in actual fact, it, it is still what I think most people would consider is a heavy industrial use. And so, it, so in that respect, Chairman, I, I kind of feel that whilst they might have addressed the point on the visual amenity, they haven't changed the process. And this remains a heavy industrial use site. Um, so, 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 so my initial thinking is, is that, that, that this hasn't, that the reasons for refusal um, haven't totally been addressed because there is still a question of the usage, even, even though the thing is, is smaller. Um, and all the other questions that have been raised about things like particulates and odours and health issues, well, they would all be tied up, I think, with, with the usage. And this is, this is a, a heavy industrial use. So again, I'm not going to make any um, recommendations until I've heard everybody else, but I am not convinced uh, that, uh, that this has been addressed. I wouldn't, I wouldn't seek to introduce any other planning reasons for refusal other than to say that the ones that were that were suggested and are on page 20 at uh, 6.2 are still relevant, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Healy. Councillor Robson. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Councillor Healy mentioned the use, and I think that that really is the pivotal thing about this you see the thing is the the description of the development calls it an asphalt plant and when people it's it's a perception thing when people think of an asphalt plant we use the word chemical chemical plant oh chemicals asphalt chemicals um and if it were instead called an asphalt mixing plant then people would say all oh, right it's just a place where they mix asphalt because that, in fact, is all that is happening here. The um, the applicant said that there are no chemical processes here. They're just heating up the materials and mixing them together, right? There's no heavy industry here. Yes, the lorries might be heavy. Yes, the materials might be heavy, but they're not taking crude oil and turning it into bitumen, that happens way, way far away, near where the boats come in. This is just simply a place where they mix two ingredients together to order and put it on lorries to, to, as, as is required. So I want to ask the officers a simple question that I wrote down yesterday, because I got confused with the smoke and mirrors, because there's a a lot of smoke and mirrors in this. There's a lot of interests that are at conflict here. Um, so I wanted to find what the actual thing that is going on here is. And so I want to ask the officers this question. Can the officers confirm that the scope of the proposed operation consists solely of the inward transportation of pre-crushed aggregate and non-coal tar bitumen, it's mixing to order and it's outward transportation, and that the only byproduct is water vapor. Thank you, Councillor Robson. 
Yeah, that is correct. That's And that's how the application has been assessed. Well, in that case, I think that most of these objections are really quite unreasonable. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Robson. Councillor Norman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, there's a couple of things which I'm concerned about, apart from all of the, the list which uh, Councillor Whittle has already listed. There's something which is rather confusing as well. At, at the pre-planning uh, presentation, we were told that the parts per million coming out of the stack was so small that it is essentially just steam, even though there was a percentage in, in there and they said it's no worse than the Dewsbury plant. If it's just steam, why is there no um, electricity generation on it? Why is there a stack there at all instead of just going to a cooling plant and then just kind of going back to river? Because, of course, steam is just hot water. Any sort of parts per million going out of that stack are going to go up and they're going to come down somewhere. So... The question really is where they come down, and obviously it's going to come down depending upon which way the wind's blowing. It could be on the on the cattery and the, uh, the, the poor little doggies, or it could be it could be on the premier cabins. Second item which I'm quite concerned about is is the introduction now by the applicant of LPG, which is something which hasn't been thought of at any point up until the pre-planning presentation. LPG, yes, okay, it has issues. It it's it's a obviously it's a gas which is going to be used in the heating up of the of the equipment, but also of course it has risks of transportation coming on and use in the site. So you've then got another vehicle coming on which is going to bring in the LPG to use on site. So we've got more more vehicle transportations, which of course moves us on then to the volume of traffic. And the volume of traffic on that on that single carriageway road, which, as we've all noticed as we drive across here, it is quite safe, but there is a lot of traffic goes up and down that road, especially to the to the coast and to the holiday destinations. Um, so at the moment, I'm kind of going to wait until anybody proposes anything, but I'm not hundred percent happy with where we are. I don't think that the amendments which have been made are uh, good enough to actually turn over the previous um, objections. And I would wait until they come back with their appeal. Thank, Thank you, you Councillor Norman. We'll just come back to our planning um, team. Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate the LPG point just from the update, um, just to clarify. We did ask the question of the applicant because of the reference to LPG in the pre-committee presentation. And the applicant confirmed that it is, and because at the moment they aren't seeking consent for the storage of LPG as part of this application, the applicant confirmed that this could be the direction that they may choose to go in, but they are aware obviously that they would need further consent. Um, and that I, yeah, just to confirm that they would need potentially need hazardous substance consent if it was over a certain tonnage of storage of, of the LPG. They also would require potentially planning consent for the vessel to store the LPG. There are some PD rights to allow for some extensions in which they could theoretically store LPG in. It might be that members want to consider removing those PD rights um, to control that in the future. But, so it's considered that the they aren't they are proposing that now. It's not it hasn't been assessed. They would need separate consent, and there are controls that could be undertaken to control that in the future. Thanks, Chairman. If if I may, um, I don't feel that we could actually move ahead on this application at this time because if we don't know what the process is, how can we judge what the process is going to be in the future? I think just to be absolutely clear, we're here today looking at this planning application. We can't foresee what somebody might put a planning application in in the future. Can we just bring in planning again? Yeah, sorry, just to confirm as well that the the applicant has done, the air quality assessment has been done on the basis that the applicant would use light fuel oil as a worst case scenario, not LPG. And that was found acceptable in air quality terms. So clearly, if they wanted to use anything other than that, they would need a separate consent from us. 
and you know and also from the HSE. Thanks Anna. Uh, Councillor Robson. Thank you Chair. Um, yeah uh, regarding what um, Councillor Norman said about steam um, steam from what I remember in my physics is is water that's heated to such a degree that it can be its pressure can be used to drive things by the time that the um, the cloud of what you call steam comes out of the chimney all the energy has come out of it um, so you can't actually use it for any energy the byproduct is water vapor not steam steam is not a byproduct steam is a is a, a for for using for for energy, so you can't recycle um, water vapor. Thank you, thanks, Councillor Robson. Councillor Meredith. Uh, thanks, Chair. I've been listening intently, taking copious notes, and uh, just a few points really. Um, I think, firstly, it were being asked, um, well, councillors Whittle and Healy mentioned earlier, um, to judge the way the applicant has designed this, to judge the the phrasing, for example, of it's essential that it's twenty meters. Now it's okay that it's 15, in Dewsbury it's 8.7. We're being asked to assess the site selection. Now, um, you know, with the greatest of respect here, I feel that this is beyond our remit in all fairness, that we're here to apply policy to the decision-making process. We're not here to question the design. I, for one, would love to sit down with architects, with planning consultants, and design the East Riding in my image. But sadly, that's not within my gift, and that's something that I don't feel can be accommodated in our decision-making process here today. Now, I can agree with the underlying comments there, the location. Not great. The visual and residential amenity certainly needing to be assessed as to the level of impact. And that, for me, is the question. Is the level of impact to such a degree that it is detrimental to the point where refusal is warranted? And that is the decision we should undertake. Now, I can appreciate the frustration behind the comments. To hear it said that it's essential it must be 20 metres, to see it being applied for again at 15, to hear of another site at 8.7, that is a circle that doesn't square, and that is a frustrating set of circumstances as decision makers to be in, where we don't know what the minimum requirements are because we have conflicting information, and from one source, no less, from the applicants. Um, on another note, traffic has been discussed. I'll tell you what traffic is. Traffic is the centre of Leeds, the centre of London, the centre of Manchester. Traffic is taking half an hour to get down Spring Bank. This is undeniably a busy road, but our own highways officer says that the traffic is not so detrimental that the, there is a warrant to refuse it. And I'm afraid I happen to agree with that. That I drive to Bridlington a lot. That is a busy road. But this will not tip the scale to such a degree that this is a marble pillar breaking the camel's back as opposed to just a straw. So I don't see uh, that that um, concern carrying water. Um, just a, a pun there on Councillor Robson's last comments. Uh, and lastly, I should also qualify that the previous decision by this committee has not yet been tested. We can't say we sat here and made a decision to refuse this as a committee and that we were right to do so. It was against officer recommendation and the planning inspectorate has not looked at that and measured whether they agree with us, quite frankly. So I would suggest that if we are minded as a committee to refuse this application, we look at this application on its merits or in the case of refusal, lack thereof, and we decide residential amenity, is it so bad it should be refused? Visual amenity, is it so bad it should be refused? And that from this point forward, Mr Chairman, if I may be so bold, we target our discussion around that very point because the rest I don't think will uh, carry water or will fall within what this committee's remit is as far as decision-making and our abilities go. Thank you, Councillor Meredith. Councillor Whittle. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Much as I would love to see the East Riding reconstructed in Council of Meredith's image, uh, the, the, the thought would please me immensely, but unfortunately, as I rightly said, it's not possible. Um, just coming back to the comments uh, made by Councillor Robson, um, I, I find it rather sad, really, that we didn't actually have a site visit to Dewsbury for this committee as we did for the last one, because uh, visiting Dewsbury brought it home to me that OK, it is just a mixing business, but by heck, what sort of a mixing business? Uh, we visited Dewsbury on a, um, a fairly damp day, uh, and there was quite a bit more damp on the site, uh, which, as I've said before, covered my shoes in dust, or actually it was some sort of slurry which dried my shoes off, so when I got home, I managed to tread white dust all over the place. 
Uh, but the actual operation itself is something which is necessary. It's brilliant. It does a really, really good job. But, Chairman, it's not the sort of operation that you would expect to find in a light industrial site. In fact, our very own report, and I'm desperately trying to scroll through this linking thing. Oh, God, I've got that up now. Um, it, it does actually say it's a material change of use, which was introduced a B2 use on the site. That's on 613. And it says the amended C will reduce the previously proposed intensity of the use by reducing the height and utilising existing buildings. I come back to Councillor Healy's comments. Use. It's being used as an industrial facility to coat asphalt, you know, to make asphalt. This is something which can be done adequately, happily, harmoniously in places which are suitable for that sort of operation to take place, like Melton, like Friday Thought. Not here, not here in the middle of um, a, a tourism zone. And here we come to Councillor Meredith's arguments about traffic. Bless. Um, I would suggest that um, Councillor Meredith might care to take a trip to uh, Hornsey uh, on a bright summer's day and see how long it takes him to get from Seaton to the town centre. That will take well over half an hour, I can tell you now. And uh, it's all right contrasting it with the Leeds and uh, other major metropolitan settlements. But when it comes down to traffic, we know about that in Launcy, I'll tell you. And also, uh, with regard to this particular road which serves the site itself, uh, that is the by-road for when Catic Hill floods, which it does regrettably when there's um, a lot of rain. And uh, you can just imagine the, uh, the amount of confusion and trouble on that sort of occasion. No, Chairman, I... I'm, I'm tilting very much towards refusal because I do not accept that this is the appropriate site. Uh, I've council, council, about can I take that as a proposal for refusal then? Yes, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Robson. Thank you, Councillor Whittle. Uh, the steam, or should I say hot air. Um, our road fairly recently was... Um, resurfaced and for about eight weeks we had trucks coming down with asphalt laying the asphalt we were passing by the asphalt truck standing next to the asphalt truck watching the hot asphalt being poured onto our road for a long period of time if this material was so hazardous how come we weren't evacuated Thank you, Councillor Robson. Any other councillors wish to come in? Councillor Healy. I think this little word use is, is the key here. Um, and indeed, it is a material change of use, um, which would introduce a B2 use onto the site. Um, and as officers say, though, it would undoubtedly change the character and appearance of the site. Um, I believe that the the usage issue is very important um and it was refused on grounds of visual amenity and use visual amenity has been improved slightly because it's not going to be as big but it is still a heavy industrial use i'd like to second the motion to refuse chair thank you councillor healy we've got nobody else with hands up but anybody else wishing to make a comment on this if not, we'll be going to the vote. So make sure you shout now before we move on. Anybody else? Yeah, we'll just bring Stephen, our planning uh, director. Thank you, thank you, Chair. And, and obviously, really good good debate across um, both sides of the, uh, the the table on on the relevant planning issues. I think j just some of the things that what what is really important from a, a planning perspective is that. We established a baseline back in, I think it was August last year, when we considered the, the second application, but the first application on this site. And so obviously all the issues that have been debated today were, were, were still relevant and equally as relevant when we considered the application um, last la, last summer time. So I think um, Councillor Healer hit the nail on the head when he, he referred back to the reasons for refusal last time at the top of page 20, um, and obviously related to the scale the use, the size, the countryside location, et cetera. Um, I know members today um, have introduced some, some other reasons in terms of the impact on neighbouring businesses and on transport and issues such as that. Um, my, my firm advice would be that it would be 
it would be unreasonable and to, to a certain extent irrational to introduce new reasons now, having already considered the application and not identified those as concerns um, six, six months ago. So um, if we are going to move to, a, to obviously a vote of refusal, we need to clarify exactly what those reasons would be. Um, but my, my firm advice is not to deviate, uh, not to introduce anything new from what was discussed discussed last time. In council, I've got Council Whittle first and then Council Healy. Chairman, as uh, as you know, uh, I'm always happy to take the advice of our Director of Planning, uh, a man of utmost integrity and virtue over the many years I've known him. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Healy. Yes, Chair, I think that's absolutely the critical point. And, and, and really, that was how I kind of approached this in the first place, that we have to have the starting point and the finishing point as the uh, reason for refusal and not introduce other things. There, there, there are other things, there's no doubt about that. And dogs getting asthma and stuff and all that is very interesting, but it's not pertinent. We get sidetracked. Um, and for me, it's about visual immunity and use, visual immunity, a little bit addressed, but overall we are considering, has this changed in any material way, the original decision from last August? Uh, and because of the use element, that word use wasn't in there, it would be very difficult to, to change it. Um, but, but, but it's changing its use to a completely different cat planning category, V2 use anyway, and it is industrial, heavy industrial. So I fully agree with what Mr Hunt has, has said there. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Healy. If there's no other councillors then wishing to speak, we'll go to the vote. Anybody else wishing to speak? So we've got a proposal for refusal from Councillor Whittle, seconded by Councillor Healy. All in favour of refusal? One, two, three, four, five, six. Those against refusal. One, two, three, four, five, six. Any abstentions? One abstention, so it will come down to the chair's vote, and I voted for uh, to, you know, not refusal. So this application's passed. No, no, no. no. Uh, uh, Sorry. They've lost. They've lost. They've lost the. They've lost the. Yeah. Uh, me, we haven't finished. So that that's fallen. Is that's that? Fallen. Yeah. We so we'll to... need we'll need a uh, um another. To yeah, approval. to move approval. Anybody wishing to move approval as officers' recommendations? I'll have to move uh, approval then as officers' recommendations. I'll be a seconder for my approval. We have a. Seconder for that. All in favour of approval? One, two, three, four, five, six. Against? One, two, three, four, five, six. Abstentions? So it comes down to the chair, so it'll be approved, I'm afraid. The application's approved. Thank you for those members that have attended. We'll have a five minute uh, break and then we'll go on to the uh, next agenda item.
Right, members, we'll make a start. So we're on to agenda item number five, and this is Carlisle Street in Gewell. Have we any uh, updates? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, item five is an application that was uh, referred from the Western Area Subcommittee last month. Um, the recommendation was to refuse the application based on flood risk grounds. Uh, the application site at 2040, 28 Carlisle Street in Gull is within a rapid inundation zone. The proposal is for a change of use and conversion of the first floor uh, retail area to form two two bedroom flats. Um, there's no updates and the application is presented to refuse. Thank you. Thank you for the update. There's no speakers on this. Obviously, this has come back from Western Area. Um, they went against officers' of recommendations and approved. So who wants to kick us off? Councillor Meredith. Thank you, Chair. Um, we've seen a lot of applications at this committee in the last year from Gull, uh, and they all have a few things in common. One is that they're all in a conservation area. Two is that they were all approved by the Western Area Committee because that committee measured each one individually and came to the conclusion that protecting the conservation area uh, was an extenuating circumstance and one strong enough to warrant a deviation from policy. We're not, we, uh, the Western Area Committee never just said, let's build it or let's allow uh, properties in a flood zone. It was, what's the harm? And the harm in this case is letting a conservation area fall to rack and ruin whilst at the same time being recognised as worthy of conservation. Uh, and so each time they're approved, each time they've come here. Another thing they've all had in common is there's been no ground floor accommodation in the sense there's been no bedrooms on the ground floor. Nobody will be asleep and be vulnerable. Uh, and that was another um, a, a factor that was assessed on each and every application by that committee. And all the ones that have been sent up here with a recommendation for approval haven't been considered to put people at risk. And so with that in mind, I'm going to sing what has now become a familiar tune and um, propose approval purely and simply because I do think that there are more merits to the application than detriments, and that the particular element of the conservation area status uh, is extenuating enough to warrant approval against policy uh, in a flood zone. Thank you, Councillor Meredith. Anybody else of approval there? If not, second that. I'd like to second, Chairman. Um, as you pointed out, the only problem with this is uh, potentially the potential flood risk which is for the whole area of Ghoul. And what do you do? People need homes. The homes are actually on the upper level, so there's no direct risk to them at that point. So I will second. I think it's, we've all just had uh, flooding training, planning training on flooding. And here we are sticking, cocking a snook at it and, Raising the, uh, yeah, almost disdainfully dismissing it. Um, we have professional officers here. Um, and I think that some of these applicants are regarding Western Area Planning as a bit of a soft touch. You know, they always approve. They, they don't listen to their officers. They will, they will always put it there and uh, approve it. And it's come here because some, you know, a more sensible, pragmatic approach has got to be taken. We, we, we have the responsibility of strategic planning to get it right. Western area can be cavalier with it because they know that it'll come here. But once it's here, I think we've got to behave like the adults in the room, frankly. Um, and we're being told very, very clearly here uh, that the reasons for refusal, um, that the uh, it's in a rapid in, uh, inundation zone and the policy sets out the change of use application with increasing vulnerability in a rapid in 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 inundation zone is not permitted and is contrary to policy. We ought to be taking our responsibilities as planning uh, councillors on this committee very seriously and not be cavalier about it. Chair, I'd like to move refusal. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Healy. So you're moving refusal. You can't move because we've got... Um, we've got yeah, so we've already, we've already got those. So we'll have to take the, the other vote first and then we'll, if that fell, we'll come back to you. So, yeah. Anybody else wishing to speak? Councillor Meredith? 
Just very quickly, Mr. Chairman, because I think it's worth noting that I would like to state that I ref I resent the implications of Councillor Healy's comments there quite strongly, actually. And I would like to take this opportunity to assure everyone in this room that Western Area Planning is by no means cavalier and is not suggesting that they can send something here knowing that the book wouldn't stop with them in any event. Unless anybody here is willing to take down a hammer and chisel and move Ghoul to a safer area, we have to deal with the fact that Ghoul is in an area where it is considered to be at a flood risk. We have also got elements of Ghoul that are, um, are a conservation area. There was an application, and Councillor Robson and I had a discussion about this, at Western Area for a caravan site in Newport. And if I remember right, the Councillor Robson, originally, you were actually in favour of the application. I pointed out exactly what Councillor Healy just did about flood risk, and in the end, that application was refused. The only reason the applications come here is when it is believed that there is mitigating circumstances that are more significant than the flood risk is detrimental. And preservation of an area that would go to rack and ruin, what we're talking about here is letting Ghoul crumble, specifically the bits of it that have been deemed as worthy of merit and worthy of conservation, or letting a building that was used as housing be reused as housing. And in a world post-COVID where people don't use offices as much as they did, where they do work from home, where the world has changed, what we're actually suggesting is that we go back to the status quo by approving this application. And anybody who is really, really, really worried about that conclusion, I invite you to move Gull to a drier area, because that's the only solution to protect the tens of thousands of residents of Gull. Otherwise, we must use a bit of pragmatism in the decision-making process and to suggest that the decision-making and the debate at Western Area was cavalier is both misinformed and insulting. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Meredith. And Councillor Healy. Well, I hear, uh, 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 Councillor Meredith's uh, indignation um, at this, but the bottom line is that disregarding a key policy in contravention of your officer's recommendation, when you've just received training on how to behave, if you can think of a better adjective than cavalier, Councillor Meredith, then I invite you to do so. Uh, if I may, Mr Chairman, you I can... can but can I just... We're not going to turn this personal. We're here to I debate... Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. We are here to debate this application, not argue amongst us. So let's stick to this application and either approve it or disapprove it. Unless we've got anything else to say, move on. I was just going to say measured, Mr Chairman, and ultimately that is what I would stress is the motivation behind my proposal. Councillor Smith, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm, I haven't been here for many meetings, uh, but like my colleague here says, with the training we've been given, everything I'm presented with me and based on the facts and based on the training I've been given, I should refuse this application in line with what the officer recommendations are. Thank you, Councillor Smith. Councillor... Uh, we do see a few of these coming up from Western planning and often, you know, I agree totally with Councillor Meredith that, you know, that's a building that's in a conservation area. And if we didn't approve the plans, it would go to rack and ruin, as I said. However, there's a change of use and it's probably a little bit te technically slightly different in that there is no further testing in a change of use application. If it, you know, a change of use that increases vulnerability, I think is the expression, um, is out straight away in an area, in this type of flooding area. And then you don't go on to have the other considerations. And um, I may be wrong, but I'm imagining that this change of use isn't going to stop something from falling into rack and ruin because we know that the ground is occupied and the upper floors have been used. They're not in rack and ruin. They're just changing the use. And I think, so we're not saving something, you know, that's crumbling. And I think in those circumstances, we need to follow the technical. So I would refuse it. Thank you, Councillor Carlis. Councillor Nenarman. Thank you, Chairman. Um, obviously, we all respect what the officers have come up with in terms of the, the positioning of this property. But it is on the... Property is on first floor. It can be considered, in my opinion, safe, and therefore I would approve it personally. Thank you, Councillor Robson. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
It's pity we don't actually have Councillor Jeffries and Councillor Jeffries here, because Councillor Jeffries and Councillor Jeffries would appeal to us on behalf of the people of Ghoul to save their town centre because it is dying and it will die and it will go, it will become derelict if the buildings aren't loved and used. We've put several through um, in Ghoul for um, accommodation on the first floor. If, if you're on the first floor of building um, and uh, you, you get wet in the night, it's not going to be because of flood water. Um, essentially, what, what we've got is buildings on stilts because of the fact that the ground floor is used for functional purposes where people can escape and the first floor is used for accommodation. I don't see a problem with that and I'm going to move to approve. Uh, Councillor Whittle. Uh, thank you, Chairman. As Councillor Robson has said, uh, we have had a, a number of these applications before us in Ghoul, uh, and inevitably we have actually approved them. Uh, my, my question to the Director of Planning, however, would be, whilst we don't accept the issue of, of setting a precedent, nevertheless, um, would it be unreasonable, in light of the fact we've approved so many in the past, to refuse this one? Stephen. That's a, that's a really good question, and um, uh, un unfortunately, Anna took took a laptop with her, and she had the pictures to show show the building. Um, so we can't show you um, any pictures um, of of the site. Um, in in terms of the the, the sim similarities, then yeah, town centre conservation area members have approved those in 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 recent in recent committees. Um, this isn't a building, as I think as Councillor Call has stated, this isn't a building that's in a particular bad state. It's not going to, to, to rack and ruin. So I think, unlike some of the others that members have approved, there's not a strong, there's not as strong an argument in terms of the, the reuse or the change of use being necessary to save to save an historic building. The building also doesn't have the same heritage, um, same historical context, I think, to some of the buildings that, that we've considered in the, in the past. So it, 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 I don't think it would be um, an, an irrational decision to, to do something different to what members have previously pre previously approved. Um, if members did want to approve this one, then you'd have to be satisfied that the benefits, and I think that those would be what Councillor Modif has identified in terms of being town centre, being a conservation area, and bringing residential use back into the building, you'd have to argue that the, those benefits outweigh the, the risk of flooding. Um, you know, there is a serious risk. It's rapid inundation zone. If there was a breach of the defences, the water would be several metres deep in this location. Um, and whilst there may be a place of safety in terms of it being on the first floor, people wouldn't be able to evacuate the building. And that's, you know, that's a difficulty. There's no, there's no evacuation route. You would be stranded in that building until someone came with a, a boat or any other form of means to try and, to, to try and um, uh, evacuate you safely. So those are the issues that, that members need to, need to weigh up. And, and obviously when we came to balance those issues up, we stuck to the side of policy, flood risk, contrary to policy, and hence a recommendation of refusal. Thanks for that. Any other members wishing to speak? Well, we go to the vote. Councillor Meredith. Just a final comment, Chair. Uh, more of a bigger picture sort of um, uh, conclusion and metaphor. It's if, if you uh, don't use it, you lose it. And whilst I can appreciate, and as Councillor Call has pointed out, and Mr Hunt, that this building is not yet in a state of disrepair, I think we're none of us are strangers enough to town centres to know that you often see shops downstairs and dereliction upstairs. And if you don't use it, you lose it. And what I don't want to see is us refuse an application today and in three years' time feel obligated to approve it because it's fallen into disrepair. And all we've done is allow for goal to become more dilapidated and forced a building owner to put more money into something after preventing them from utilizing it in a cost effective way ultimately this was a house it would have still been a house and been acceptable under planning as a house had it not been changed to commercial use and all that has been suggested by the applicant is to let it be used as once it was we're not suggesting building new properties. That I would be in a complete agreement with Councillor Helion would be an entirely different measure to be applied. But this is an existing structure. 
This is no different from any of the neighbours that are being used as residential properties. And if it is that dangerous, then this council should be before the end of or before sundown today, moving those people out if it is really that dangerous. And Councillor Meredith, Councillor Healy. We've set a very dangerous precedent of ignoring policy on flooding. Um, and the question really is about the the mitigating factors, which obviously the Western area came up with. They, they, they made the decision as they felt there were mitigating factors in favour, including the reuse of the building um, and bringing the building back into use. Um, and each of these cases needs to be taken on its merits. Um, and, and the reality is that this is a, this this building is different, as Mr. as Mr. Hunt has said, and there isn't a sort of imperative around uh, around a building that's falling into disrepair here. And I do think that you know uh, the fact that a precedent has already been set is not a reason for continuing the trend. In fact, the res the reverse is true because it effectively says, well, look, we will consider each of these on its merits. And in this case of this particular building, we believe potentially, and I would say so, that the mitigating factors in favor do not um, uh, suggest that we should uh, overturn the policy and go against the policy, um, which is important to all of us. And all of us have, have understood the planning training um, and, that, and that going forward, I think we need to make the point that this is a separate building. It's a separate application. In this case, uh, the mitigating factors do not suggest that we should be disregarding policy. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Councillor. If there's no other councillors wishing to speak, then we've got um, on the table a move to approve by Councillor Meredith, seconded by Councillor Steele. Are we happy with the reasons? Do we? Are we? Are you going, Councillor Meredith? The reasons? Are you going with um, what Western Area? used or do you want to bring some of your own in? Uh, no, thank you, Mr Chairman. I think uh, it's worth pointing out that this isn't a precedent setting. This is, it's not even a consistent approach. It is exactly as you and Mr Hunt said, looking at it on its individual reasons. This debate was had at Western Area. If I remember rightly, it was approved unanimously there. I felt comfortable with the decision now and looking at it afresh today without prejudice, I feel in exactly the same boat. I do feel that those reasons stand and stand uh, stand strongly enough to warrant not only uh, my vote of approval, but my proposition. And uh, it's not an uncommon day when I'm propositioning, but that's a separate story. Just bring our director back in. Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, just looking at the reasons that Weston gave on, on page 46, paragraph 1.1, 1 .1, uh, there's, there's no mention there to, to conservation and heritage, so um, perhaps, Councillor Meredith, it might be um, helpful to include the, the first point you raised about the site being within a conservation area and that, and that in positive heritage impact as one of the reasons as well. Councillor Meredith? Well, uh, I was, I'd certainly be more than happy to add that to the list, um, and uh, I'm... I've been to more planning training uh, meetings than I can count, but I still will always defer to officers when it comes to phrasing, mainly because there's not enough paper and ink if I don't. Um, but if we are going to go for a list of reasons, I would ask that it's also considered that the growth of Gaul, that the sizable industrial area, and indeed, if you look further north to the other side of the M62, and there are significant employment options that are there presently and approved and will be forthcoming in the future, and that actually the need for residential development uh, alongside that at Howden uh, uh, would warrant uh, approval of this as well as quite frankly, common sense, conservation, uh, and everything else that we've just listed and discussed. Just quickly bring Council Healy back in. Uh, at the risk of not wanting to uh, prolong this, uh, it's just quite ironic that Councillor Meredith says he, he defers to officers and listens to his planning training. If that were the case, he'd be refusing this application because that's what we should be Come going. On, no, we're going round and round in circles. So we've got Councillor Meredith has moved approval with reasons, seconded by Councillor Steele. Can we go to the vote, please? Oh. Yeah, through you, Chairman. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there was just a couple of points about conditions, um, one of them being that the development is carried out in accordance with the submitted FRA, and then two standard conditions, one to deal with time limits and the third one to deal with the pre-plans. Thank you. Yeah, I think we're all fine with that. So we'll go to the votes on this. So we're, we're, we're going to vote on uh, going against officer recommendations for the uh, points uh, Councillor Meredith uh, set out in his uh, move to approve. So all in favour of approval? Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Those against? Three. Any abstentions? Ah, oh, it's been approved.
Thank you, members. Um, item number six, future planning applications. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Mem members will see that we've we've increased the list. So I think it was a request that um, maybe Councillor Whistle made uh, a few a few weeks ago, but um, often it wasn't clear to members which items may come to the next committee. So we've we've included in item six now every item that, as things currently stand, has been called into committee or needs a committee decision. So it doesn't follow that all of these will come to the next committee, but all of these, as things currently stand, will need a committee decision. So if there's any that members want to flag up to visit, then, then, then please do so. The only point I wanted to make on um, suddenly jumping for um, site visits is we'll be coming up to the AGM shortly and we hopefully we'll all still be sat here, but maybe some shuffles around. So I would advise, unless there's something coming up on the next one that you want to visit, just wait and see who's sat on this committee. We could all go marching off on 10 site visits and then none of us are sat on this um, planning committee after May. So, yep. Anybody want to bring anything else up while we're all sat? If not, oh, Councillor Norman. Sorry. I guess if we're looking at these applications as, as future potentials for site visits, certainly the two in Bridlington, um, at where we, Peter Haddock Limited, and also on the Airedale Drive, will be useful to visit. Do you want to make a decision on that now? They want to I would. I, I, so I was just going to say, I would suggest, Chair, that you that you vote on on whether or not you want to visit those sites, and then obviously we will make the arrangements the week before they do come to whichever committee it would be. Yeah. Right. Let's go with what Councillor Norman just said about the two sites in Bridlington. Are we in favour of a site visit for those? Just raise your hand if you are. That looks pretty much like we are. Yeah. No, that's fine. So we'll make arrangements for that. Councillor Robson, did you were you in favour? Yeah. I was just going to say it's my neck of the woods. Why shouldn't I? Um... <laughs> You're all entitled to go around these on your own. I still well. pay the yeah. expenses, mine. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, Councillor Smith, did you want to come in? Thank you, Chair. There's a there's a few on here. Um, all of the ones connected with Yarrow's aggregates, please. So one visit for each of them for them. And I'm just trying to find it now. Is the solar farm as well? So are we all in favour of going to the Yarrow site? Great. Yeah. Sure, sorry. Okay. I was just going to ask Council Norman, but you went straight to the vote. Um, might it be prudent to suggest why we're going? Because ultimately, if I'm going to get in the car and drive to Bridlington or drive to Withensea or drive to Brough, and it's a mile down the road, if we're not going for a purpose, then it's like going to the opening of an envelope. Um, what, what is the reason that it's necessary to see it in 3D? Major. We've already voted, but Councillor Norman wants to come back in. Oh, well, uh, it, was, it wasn't so much on Councillor Norman. Yeah, yeah. As Councillor Robson said, we've already voted. It's more along the lines of every one of us will say the one in our ward is important. It's a major application. But actually, we're applying planning policy, and it's not that hard in some instances. And in some instances, it really is, hence the need for a site visit. Yeah. But I, for one, I mean, this is my fifth of seven meetings today. If I'm going to try and have to cancel something else or accommodate it, I need to know why, and I need to know it's worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. Councillor Smith next. Yeah. So, sorry. So, sorry. Um, on, on the subject of policy, you just voted against policy. So I'll make your mind up. Oh. Right. Um, so Yar Yarrow's aggregates, we need to go. Um, and also to the solar farm in Ticton. That's it. That's yeah. sort of side visits. It's just to make... It's just to make the point that often the site visits, certainly on the subcommittees, are outcomes of decisions. They are decisions, should we go on a site visit? But here it seems to be different. I don't, honestly don't know sometimes, I agree with Councillor Meredith, as I often do, um, that... Uh, 
you really have to have a reason for a site visit. And actually, if you're considering a planning application and the decision is let's have a site visit, why why can't we do that with this? Why do we have to sort of have them all kind of lined up in advance? I suppose that's a question I'd, I'd put. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there's there's no reason why members can't still decide on the day of committee if you've not been to, to site, but having heard the, the the responses for and against, you feel that a site visit is necessary, then clearly you can defer to go on site. So that, that we're not um, seeking to prevent that. It's just in the interest of being being efficient, and because there's often a much longer time frame in the lead up to the strategic applications coming to committee, we've got a much clearer idea as to to what what is what is coming your way, so we can identify these. And if you feel that a, a site visit is important, you can flag it up. But what I would suggest is just stick to those that you feel are really really crucial in terms of having a site visit. So the arrows core one is a good idea because that is as that site has always been relatively controversial in the past and, and seeing that site would be it would be a good idea um in terms of bridlington it's an allocated site so um it's, it's a big it's a big development but it's an allocated site where the principle's been established so it's just making sure that that you're happy that, that you know a site visit is needed for these sites and again from a chair's point of view i won't hold it against anybody if you don't go so you choose if you feel you want to go on that site visit you go People are at work, you know, it's up to you guys. If you want to go, you go. If we're only going to end up with a couple of members going there, let's not waste officers' time in terms of minibuses and things like that. You could get yourselves there, have a look around and come back. So it's got to be sensible with it. You know, let's not, you know, waste people's time. Council Meredith, then we'll end. Just to say that, for example, the Howden site visit was really useful, the one we undertook six or seven months ago. That, there was a minibus arranged. Uh, we got a lot of information on the way there from officers on the way back. We had a lot to talk about. That was a very good example of why, why the site visit process exists. And if... It, again, another great example. And if, if we're going on, on site visits for those, not only will I be the first one to support them, but I'll make sure I'm there. I'll, I'll consider it a priority. But what I don't want is to start seeing 12 site visits before every meeting just because it helps a councillor say to the local residents, I'm making sure I'm representing you. That's not what we're here for. Yeah, just to say on the um, Yarrow one, it is actually quite controversial. And I think it would be really beneficial to have the officer there with us just explaining everything before the actual meeting. 